Hi, I am Jeff Paolo, Director of the Acute and Critical Care Institute. From its name, our institute is tasked to care for any acutely ill patient from the time of first contact. We provide pre-hospital care, emergency and intensive care, and resuscitative services. The discipline we practice and train in requires a high level of professional knowledge and technical skills, and the majority of the sessions in this postgraduate course talk about these. But anybody knows that clinical knowledge on its own does not always translate to better patient outcomes. We have all seen how smart, excellently trained clinicians, individuals or teams can make clinical decisions that lead to poor outcomes. Analyses of clinical sentinel events reveal personal, team, or systemic factors that led to avoidable deaths or suffering. Unfortunately, whatever lessons are learned during post-mortem analyses are not shared with the whole organization and disappear with each graduating batch of trainees. So we recognize the need to understand how a clinician or a team of clinicians makes decisions under stress and how to improve this before they are in a clinical emergency. However, our traditional textbooks always tell us what to think, but never how to think. Consequently, for more than a decade, this program and curriculum have been quietly developed, gathering insights and lessons from diverse sources, but mainly from the military and martial disciplines, which have also attempted to describe or codify decision-making under extremely stressful conditions with human lives at stake. The main difference being, Usually, a clinician isn't going to lose their own life or those of their teammates due to poor decision-making. The idea of integrating martial theory into clinical discipline is not new. For example, the Team Steps program of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality is adapted from the U.S. Department of Defense. This excellent program is used in many hospitals around the world to improve patient safety by using teamwork strategies developed in the military sphere. Our project is nicknamed Cadmus, Cadmus being the first Greek hero and a slayer of dragons. Our dragon is poor decision-making at the individual or team level. The project seeks not only to address individual practice, but also to inform policy and to provide the framework for critiquing and analyzing acute clinical decisions made under duress. The curriculum is huge, and we are only beginning to learn how to teach it. But today, we will focus on some aspects or techniques usable by the individual clinician that will serve as a short primer. Our main teachers for this session include a Navy SEAL commander, a cognitive psychologist, a fighter pilot, and a gunslinger. Ready? Let's start with our case. A 55-year-old man is in the COVID ICU Go undergoing mechanical ventilation. He required prone ventilation and had stabilized with it, but has just now developed catachypnea and tachycardia, higher ventilation pressures, and a drop in saturation. On exam, the right lung seems to have slightly decreased breath sounds. Suctioning reveals no secretions, so an X-ray is ordered. The image is transmitted, and a pneumothorax is seen on the left, so a patient is supinated in preparation for chest tube insertion. Normally, when we describe a case, the most efficient way of transmitting the information is through a detailed problem list. This on its own is critical, but clinicians often lose valuable information in the problem list because a lot of problems are not diagnoses with an ICD code. Also, describing ambiguous situations within a truncated time frame is not taught nor is it a requirement for documentation, but it is extremely helpful, especially when building context for decisions under stress. This leads our discussion to several things. The first is to develop a sense for changes over time, which is not integrated into most problem lists. The second is the importance of building and monitoring context in a case. The third is to proactively develop and execute contingency plans when the future is uncertain. For changes over time, we turn to Admiral William McRaven, commander of the U.S. Navy SEALs when Bin Laden was taken down. 
In 1995, he published Case Studies in Special Ops Warfare. This example is about the rescue of American POWs from a camp outside of Cabanatuan in 1945, which, by the way, can be watched on Netflix now as the movie The Great Rape. The analysis has time on the x-axis and probability of success on the y-axis. Mission success is dependent on correct actions performed over time that lead to a point where the chance of success is greater than the chance of failure, called the relative superiority line, or RS line, in the diagram. In any mission, it is possible that even if early actions lead to relative superiority, defeat can still occur at periods of increased vulnerability. This is the same in clinical situations. In our adaptation, the y-axis is still the probability of a good outcome. If you like, we can think of these as patients' hit points. Some management students will also recognize this time graph as that being of a stock over time with inflows and outflows, the stock being hit points, inflows being therapeutic actions leading to clinical improvement, and outflows being deterioration. Relative superiority is achieved when all best practices are followed. RS does not guarantee 100% success because not all parts of the outcome are under our control. But it does help to remind us which actions are critical based on the available relevant evidence and that we need to perform those actions in time. Additionally, we define a line of irretrievability where a bad outcome, whether death or permanent disability, will occur unavoidably. This defines where a clinical team must change strategies completely. In some cases, palliative care is most appropriate. In other cases, damage control procedures. The line is higher and easier to hit when resources are limited. Imagine, for example, caring for this critically ill patient in the absence of a ventilator. Frequently, there will be a bad acute event that will precede a bad outcome. Some authors just call this bang. In a military context, it is an ambush or an attack. In a clinical context, bang is any event that significantly changes the trajectory of the patient's journey for the worse, and a patient can suffer many bangs in their course. When this happens, whether it is a cardiopulmonary arrest, a stroke, a due ventilator-associated pneumonia, the mission difficulty completely changes. Therefore, it is vitally important to stay left of Bang. What will Bang look like? An easy technique advocated by cognitive psychologist Dr. Gary Klein is to conduct a pre-mortem. One imagines that the bad outcome has already occurred. The patient has died already. How did they die? This technique is being used in diverse industries such as banking and business. If you take the time to imagine bang, you may come up with one-third more differentials and therefore guide your team on how best to protect your patient. Our case begins in the middle of the hospitalization, which means that previous diagnoses and treatments have already been done. Anything to the left up to the current time is clinical context. Anything to the right is in the realm of clinical prediction. The most likely and dangerous event that follows is predictable as a tension pneumothorax causing cardiac arrest. This is easily treated, but how far are we from bang? Our patient hasn't even had hypotension yet, so do we really need to call in the surgeons? People tend to extrapolate linearly, even if changes are actually exponential, so there is a danger of committing too few resources early enough to still change outcomes. Also, there was already a time lag between the performance of the x-ray and the relaying of the information to the bedside clinician, so we have moved farther to the right already. Delays between a decision and an effect, or between information requests and actionability should always be considered, because the tempo of subsequent actions will determine the part of the outcome that we can control we must understand how decisions are made in time. The way a human mind uses context to translate to decision and actions was elegantly described by Colonel John Boyd, whose OODA loop theory was originally developed for air-to-air -air dogfights. OODA 
refers to the cyclical processes of observation, orientation, decision, and action. In human conflict, simply put, a fighter with a faster UDA cycle can outthink and act to force his enemy to make worse and worse decisions to a point where they can no longer fight. A disease does not have an UDA loop. Instead, it has a pathophysiology that dictates its continuous actions. Since we are the only humans in the conflict, it is our own OODA loop that we have to manage, and the faster our loops are, the better. This gives us the agility required in a dynamic situation and avoids the death spiral of decisions made in panic. The advantage of the disease is it doesn't have to think, and therefore it cannot make bad decisions. Our advantage is that with an adequate mental model, we can predict how a situation can unfold and act accordingly. Observation refers to gathering data from monitors, vent displays, interviews, physical exams, diagnostics. The faster the EMR, PAX upload, or the ability to do a bedside focus are salient to the observation step in our case. Orientation is more complex. Some elements are situational awareness, sense-making, outcomes prediction, and personal mindset. We will return to orientation as we progress. Decision and action may seem self-explanatory, but between the mental decision and action execution, there is also a communication step. It is important to remember that each step imposes a time cost. And also, whenever it is a team that makes decisions, the OODA loop is dependent on the slowest member. Let's not forget that except in extreme emergencies where paternalistic decision-making is permissible, the patient or their family should be part of this loop too. So, although it may look like a quick decision cycle from presentation and x-ray interpretation to the placement of a chest tube, it may actually look like this with only three people on the team. Every new decision cycle means the clock is moving. So depending on the processes and scope of practices in your own system, a 15-minute therapeutic process can be delayed for hours. The difference between a theoretical perfect process and reality has been called machine friction, something that we must all work to decrease. Stealing time by skipping unnecessary steps shortens the OODA loops and allows us to redirect our focus if necessary. Temporizing measures can stretch the time before deterioration and keeps us left of bang. The surgical team has been called and they are preparing their equipment. The residents are discussing the procedure with the family members to get consent for a left-sided chest tube. So far, so good. We don't know how close we are to ban. What we do know that deterioration can continue before the chest tube is placed. So some contingency plans should be in place, such as preparing for an emergent needle thoracostomy. Making use of dead time proactively like this is a hallmark of better performing clinical teams. We must be ready to escalate for the worst case scenario because worst case scenarios happen more often than we think. But let's rewind. Let's return to the orientation step, which as I said is complex. The reason for this is that personal mindset plays heavily into it. Everybody knows a clinician for whom it is more important to be right and refuses to deviate from their chosen course in the face of mounting evidence to the contrary. Or someone who in their interest to not be a nuisance, or who fears to step on other people's toes, trades clinical efficacy for interpersonal cohesion. Our mission is to protect a patient's quality of life. And in the emergency context, it means reversing acute illness and protection from bang. Most other missions are side quests. Another part of mindset is emotional temperature. Enter Jeff Cooper. U.S. Marine and handgun expert. Cooper's color codes are used to describe the conditions of psychological activation in times of stress. White means unaware and unprepared. A person who is completely relaxed or unalert, therefore an inappropriate condition when on duty. Yellow is the default condition. Relaxed but alert should be the mindset of clinicians, especially in monitored settings. Orange means a threat has been detected and therefore needs to be investigated. Red means the crisis is ongoing 
and the fight is on. Black means that your OODA loop is defeated, you are lost in panic, and your patient will not do well. So in the usual monitoring, we are in continuous condition yellow. Clinical threat indicators show up as changes in the patient's scores that are not part of baseline variations, and differentiating the two depends on how well we have built context. Indicators may look like unexpected changes in vital signs, surprising diagnostic findings, or clinical signs that do not agree with each other. Once these occur, we move to condition orange, because these anomalies need to be investigated further and then managed appropriately or dismissed as unimportant. In the beginning of the case, the deviations in vital signs were the indicators that needed to be investigated and therefore led to where we are now, preparing for the chest tube. But did you catch another anomaly also at the very beginning? Here's the story recapped. A 55-year-old man on prone ventilation was reported to have a left-sided pneumothorax on x-ray. This was in contrast to the physical findings where the decreased breath sounds were on the right. In the meantime, the surgeons are preparing for a left-sided CTT insertion, while the ICU team is preparing for a left-sided needle thoracostomy in case of sudden deterioration. Restating the story has made it clear that we may be heading towards a disaster. And in fact, the U.S. Navy prescribes a technique for high-consequence decision-making called STEP, where we create a story, story being data points arranged in time including a prediction of outcome, test for conflicts, evaluate the story for accuracy and areas of uncertainty, and finally, develop contingency plans in case our story is the wrong one. STEP forces us to think critically about our mental model, the assumptions in the model, and more importantly, its weaknesses. We have already identified a conflict in our data, which can be resolved in several ways. Call back to radiology, a careful re-examination of the x-ray image, or the performance of a chest ultrasound. Recall that the patient was prone when the original x-ray was performed, so the film may have been flipped. In the meantime, it is important to communicate our thoughts to the surgical team. Re-examination of the image does show the clues. Diaphragm should be higher on the right side and the right mainstem bronchus should be more obtusely angled. The heart is also shaped weird. Granted again, lung fibrotic and atelectatic changes may have altered the usual anatomy. Later, radiology did revise their reading because of the flipped image. Due to worsening tachycardia, now with a slight drop in blood pressure, a needle thoracostomy was performed at the right second interspace midclavicular line. The CTT was placed in the right half an hour later. What has just been presented is a primer of a sprawling work in progress. I am sorry to say that this will not be a substitute for reading medical textbooks, but hopefully it can help supplement the knowledge base with a different perspective to deal with our dynamic and ambiguous clinical sphere. Because any decision-making skills training program should be experiential, CADMUS does not lend itself well to a classroom lecture format. We are still examining how best to integrate this into simulation sessions, but we find that small group discussion formats are useful, even online. Some of the leaders or teachers in the audience will recognize that the same techniques can be used to guide policy writing and clinical program development. In fact, one of the biggest lessons in studies of high-consequence decision-making is that our systems should be engineered in a way to empower the frontline to make the most optimal decisions at the time of crisis. Or conversely, systems should prevent the frontline from being forced to make bad, lose-lose decisions. I hope that this session was useful. Here is an incomplete bibliography that was used to develop the program, and I invite interested people to chime in and tell us what you think about it, or better yet, help develop it. I will be happy to continue the discussion here and elsewhere. Thank you for your attention.